with the group. So today, she's going to tell you all about uh, what she does uh, for a living and ties it in to, to, uh, to Carol at Carol Interests. So it's my pleasure to uh, invite my uh, love of my life, my wife, Ellen schaefer Sounds. Dear. <laughs> you didn't say your birthday. Uh, the reason I married him is his birthday is October 6th, so that's 10 6, like the Mad Hatter's hat. So that's, that's the main reason I married him. <laughs> okay, so yes, it's been a long time that you all have known me and you've never heard me talk, and I am a lecturer. I've been a professor, an adjunct professor, for the last 20 years, and I'll get to that. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about psychological theories that are related to Lewis Carroll and his writings. So if you think I'm going to talk about, you know, Freudian things falling down the rabbit hole and what does that mean, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, this is different and it's going to be uh, hopefully different than you thought it would be. All right, so who am I? A lot of you know who I am as Ellie. There's two me's. There's Ellie and there's Ellen. So Ellie, I'm a third generation collector of all things Lewis Carroll. Whoops, I think we just lost our, um, our guest here. We have Edward Wakeling was Skyping in, if anyone wants to say hi to him in a little bit, but I think we just lost him. Okay, um, so I am Ellie. So uh, I grew up with Lewis Carroll stuff. And I, it was in my home, it was all over. My father and my mother had it everywhere. Uh, my grandmother started collecting Alice in Wonderland books before Lewis Carroll died. She started collecting them in the 1890s, and then my father took over the collection, and my mother really pushed the collection. And my mother was the secretary of the society and ran the society from our house. And when I was little, you know, the phone would ring, and I would, I would be like, oh, it's that cute guy Ken calling me, you know? And I'd answer the house phone, and this person would be like, is this the Lewis Carroll Society of North America? And I'd be like, oh. Ma, it's for you, you know, and it's like, that's, that was my life. So yes, I sort of got away from it um, for a little bit because I didn't want to do what my parents were doing. So I, I moved on, uh, but my mother uh, started collecting teapots, and then she died in uh, 1996. And when she died, it was sort of an interesting thing. I went back to all the Lewis Carroll things because it was a way to be close to my mother. And I expanded her teapot collection because it was a way to be close to my mother. So if anyone's coming over tonight to see the teapot collection, uh, that's where you're going to be for dessert tonight. Um, so those are my connections to uh, Alice in Wonderland from the beginning. So I was um, brainwashed as a young child. So there's my mom and my dad. That's about 25 years ago. That was at a party I think we had for our daughter Lena, who's now... Uh, 25. So I think she was about four years old. To me, that's about 21 years ago, shortly before my mother died. That's my mom and my dad, and that's just a little sampling of my teapots. I have to put it up there, sorry. I'm not talking about teapots today. Okay, so the other me is Ellen. I'm Ellen. Professionally, I'm known as Ellen and not Ellie, but the reason you all call me Ellie is because that's what my parents called me when you all first met me. Um, but I like the name Ellie, so please keep calling me Ellie. Um, so I'm a clinical social worker, and I don't know if you all know what a clinical social worker is. It's, it's a social worker who can be a mental health therapist, so it's similar to a psychologist. And I've been a, a clinical social worker for over 30 years, and my specialty, I have um, a therapy, mental health therapy private practice. I've had it for about 25 years. I'm the director of the practice. I have therapists that work under me, and my specialty is working with clients who are deaf. So deaf or hard of hearing. So I know sign language fluently and it's really great for these clients because a lot of deaf people have to have therapy through an interpreter but if they come see me then I can talk to them directly in sign language. Um, so my specialty is working with people with physical disabilities. So I have clients that are deaf, I have clients that are blind, I have clients that are deaf and blind, I work with people who have cerebral palsy or multiple sclerosis, uh, people that are physically disabled but my real real specialty is working with the deaf. Um, I uh, thought that when I picked that career, it would be very separate from the Alice in Wonderland stuff. <laughs> Didn't always turn out to be. Um, and so today, that's what I'm going to explain, how my two uh, professions came back together. But it's, it's very interesting working with clients who are deaf. I've had some very interesting clients. Um, 
when I work with deaf blind clients, sometimes you have to hold their hands and sign into their hands. Sometimes they have to sit across the room because they have tunnel vision. So there's different things I've had to do. Um, I've had a client that back in the day, uh, this was about 20 years ago, it was called multiple personality syndrome. Now it is dissociative, dis dissociative identity disorder. Uh, but I worked with a client for a while that had 12 distinct personalities. 10 were deaf and two were hearing. Everyone always asks me to explain that one and I can't quite explain that one, but she was severely abused and 10 personalities were deaf and two were hearing. We can get into that later if you want. Um, so I have also, in the days that I've been doing uh, therapy, I've also been an adjunct professor at several universities. There's a university here for the deaf. It's called Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. And so there's a very large population of deaf people in the Washington, D.C. area. So this has been a very good place for me to live and work and uh, do things. And I've taught social work classes at Gallaudet. Um, and uh, I thought, well, I'm going to go back and get my Ph.D., because I've been an adjunct professor, and if I get my PhD, then I will be able to become a full-time professor somewhere. And that's what I did, and I graduated a year ago. So I am now Dr. Ellie. And uh, I just got a job about a couple weeks ago. I'm going to be working at Salisbury University starting in the fall, which is part of the University of Maryland system on the eastern shore of Maryland. So I'm very excited about that. <coughs> so, thank you. Just found that out. So it's when I went back to get my PhD that my two worlds started colliding. Because, you know, I'm doing therapy, and I got my Alice in Wonderland thing on the side. And yeah, quotes come up here and there, and, you know, there's things that happen. But the, the two me's started merging when I went to uh, start my PhD program. I hope you like my little test at merging the me's. Ooh. Ooh. So I work with a lot of people with anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, personality disorders. <laughs> Fun, fun. <laughs> Been to Oxford. Teapot. 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 Okay. So two me's collided when I went to get my PhD. Whoops. So the first article I read, the very first article I was assigned to read when I started my PhD program, started with this quote. The very first article. I was like, oh no, what's going on? <laughs> so. This quote, if you can't see it in the back, it says, When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many <laughs> different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master. That's all. So that was the very first quote in the very first social work <laughs> article I read about social work <clears throat> theories. Then, second week of class, not the first article, but another article had Alice's quote, I knew who I was this morning, but I've changed several times. I've changed a few times since then. So that was another quote. So I'm like, okay, we're good. Just a few Alice quotes, nothing worse. And then I came across the dodo effect in my readings. I'm like, what is the dodo effect and is it related to Lewis Carroll? So I started reading an article all about the dodo effect. So the dodo effect uh, there, there are over about 500 different kinds of therapies. There's many, many different kinds of therapies that therapists can use. These are some of them. Um, there's crisis intervention modalities where you work with someone that's, you know, had some sort of crisis in their family. There, there's, you know, big crises like 9-11 uh, or maybe their house burnt down or things like that. Uh, psychodynamic theory. I do a lot of psychodynamic theory with uh, my deaf clients that looks at how what happened in their past <coughs> relates to their future, and you work with the impact of that. Cognitive behavioral therapy changes the way people think now into a different way of thinking. If people think negatively, you try to help them think more positively. I can keep going. There's client-centered therapies. There's feminist theory. Feminist theory looks at the, uh, uh, it, it aims to empower women and looks at the discrimination against women, and there's some good feminist theory techniques you can use. Behavior modification, you all have probably heard of. Punishment and rewards you give people to help try and change their behavior. There's creative therapies like art therapy. Uh, I do something called sand tray therapy, dance therapy, many, many different kinds of therapy. <coughs> Uh, narrative therapy has to do with writing. You do writings for different kinds of therapies. So there's many different te techniques and different kinds of therapies. 
So how do we know which is the best approach? How do you know what to use with a client? Is something better than something else? I don't know. So what does the research tell us about that? Is there a certain modality that is better than another to treat a patient when you're working with someone in therapy? Whoops. Nope. So as early as 1936, Saul Rosenzweig uh, mm -hmm. in St. Louis uh, decided he was going to research which was the best therapy. Um, and he found out that there's really no therapy that's better. They researched and researched and researched and tried to figure it out. And it seemed that the relationship between the therapist and the client was more important than the therapy itself. Okay, and so he decided that he was going to call that the dodo bird uh, metaphor. Because the dodo bird says, at last the dodo said, everyone has won and all must have prizes. So all the therapies are the same, they all must have prizes. You can picture all the therapies running around a circle, right? All the different kinds, cognitive, behavioral, psychodynamic, it's all running around a circle and they all stop and they're all the same. So that's where he came up with that. So uh, the dodo effect or the dodo verdict, some uh, people call it, uh, refers to that claim. There's different uh, therapists that have studied it since. There was a big study in 1975 and another big study in 1997, and they all come up with the same thing, that all the therapies are basically, <laughs> can work the same, uh, but you know it depends on your relationship with the client. And obviously, when I'm working with clients, I will try and figure out which therapy I think will work better for a certain client, but in general, no one therapy is better than another. There is a certain <laughs> therapy that might be better to work with a certain client. Okay, <laughs> so I kept going in my PhD program, and then we come up with the looking glass self. Has anyone heard of the looking glass self? No? So the looking glass self is by Cooley, Charles Horton Cooley. He coined the term in 1902 and he took it from the writings of Lewis Carroll. And um, <coughs> he uh, was, the looking glass self is the beginning of symbolic interactionism. If you know what that is, if you know sociology, uh, you might have heard of symbolic interactionism. Um, it has to do with the things around you impact how you think. So you're all sitting in a room full of Lewis Carroll collectors, that's going to impact how you think tomorrow. <laughs> that's part of what symbolic interactionism is. So the things around you, the things you interact with, make who you are, make how you think. Okay? Um, so the looking glass self was the uh, beginning of that. Just give me one second. Um, there's another problem. <laughs> Edward left the sign. Um, so, the looking glass self, oh, here we have uh, Mr. Cooley and Mr. Mead. So you can see they lived around the time that Lewis Carroll was writing. They look a little mean, don't they? They look alike. They look alike, yeah. And they look like Freud. <laughs> and they look like they all, yeah. So these, the, um, they're both American. I was going to say, I talk a lot in my classes about theories that are from, you know, white European men, but these actually are white American men. Um, and that some of the theories don't always apply to you if you're not a white European man. But um, they're, they're American, both of them. Um, so the looking glass self, uh, there's three things. We imagine how others see us, and then we imagine the judgments that others make of us, and then we develop a feeling about that. So we feel about ourselves. We think, what does someone else think of us? If someone thinks, oh, I'm stupid, then you, you, know, you might feel that you're stupid. Or if you think, oh, people think I'm really smart. Now I got this PhD, so people must think I'm smart. Then you're gonna feel that people think you're smart. It's not how others see you, but how you feel other people see you, okay? And that impacts how you see yourself. So we'll do an example. Here's a lovely lady with the Alice in Wonderland shirt on. So she wears that shirt to high school and she's a little nervous about it because she doesn't know if people are gonna think she's cool or not. Uh, two friends tell her that it's a very cool shirt and so now she feels like everybody looking at that shirt thinks it's very cool and she feels really good about herself and what she's wearing that day, okay? That's a very brief, short example. Uh, and then here's another example. We have a boy who's told by a teacher that he didn't do well on a test. So the teacher didn't say he was a terrible student, just he didn't do well on this one test. Um, he's very upset and he feels that the teacher thinks he's a bad student. 
And then he wonders how many other teachers think he's a bad student. And then he goes into his class where his favorite teacher didn't call on him today. So, oh my gosh, she must think I'm a bad student. He decides he's a bad student and doesn't do well in school that day. So that's the looking glass self. It's not really how other people see you, but how you think other people are seeing you. Okay? <laughs> so, I won't, I don't have to say anything for that. Okay. Um, Just suppose you switch the mirrors. Switch the mirrors. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, so, and again, these people are looking in the mirror, and if they, well, the people and the cat, the cat thinks he's pretty cool. Because maybe he's been real rough and tough with other cats, I don't know. Okay. Next we have the Alice in Wonderland Syndrome, which I do know people have heard of. <clears throat> that did not come up in my readings in my PhD program. The, the other two things did. <laughs> but I did some studying about other psychological sy syndromes that relate to Alice in Wonderland and Lewis Carroll. So we have the Alice in Wonderland Syndrome. So the Alice in Wonderland Syndrome, which is called AIWS <laughs> or AWS, depending if you want to put the in in there, um, describes uh, people that have migraines, people that you don't necessarily have to have a migraine, but you feel these body changes. So people feel that they're bigger or smaller than they really are. Um, they have these after migraines or just at nighttime during dreaming. Uh, they may feel that just their right arm is bigger than the rest of their body or their left leg um, or that their head's really big and their ears are really small. And usually this happens, um, it's more of a medical thing than a psychological thing, but it uh, has psychological <coughs> symptoms. So one of the feelings is that you're short and fat. So that's why we have Tweedledum and Tweedledee on the picture. Okay, uh, a person, Caro, not Carol, but Caro Lippmann discussed uh, migraines in a 1952 <laughs> journal article and talked about the feeling of a Tweedledum and Tweedledee feeling after migraines. And then a Dr. Todd coined the phrase Alice in Wonderland syndrome, and the syndrome is also called the Todd syndrome. So if you hear about the Todd syndrome, it's the same thing as the Alice in Wonderland syndrome. And that was in 1955. Um, and, and people that we know have written a lot about this, Dr. Sandra Bernstein and Selwyn Goodacre have researched the syndrome and whether Lewis Carroll had it or not. Okay? How many people think Lewis Carroll had it and that's how we got the story? No? How many people think Lewis Carroll did not have Alice in Wonderland syndrome? Very good. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, this is a patient quote about the syndrome. Um, one patient said, I felt that I was very tall when walking down the street. I would think that I would be able to look down on the tops of others' heads. And it was very frustrating and annoying not to see as I was feeling. This is, the sensation was so real that when I would see myself in a window or full-length full mirror, it was quite a shock to realize that I was still my normal height of under five feet. Okay? And usually when people get this feeling, it doesn't last for long, maybe 20 minutes, not very long. Okay, uh, so the syndrome has a medical cause, but it presents with uh, psychological symptoms. So there's visual hallucinations. Do you all know the difference between a hallucination and a delusion? Hallucination is visual? So hallucination is something that's not really there, but it can be any of your five senses. So you can see things that aren't really there, you can hear things that aren't really there. And, and by the way, my deaf clients do have uh, auditory hallucinations. Isn't that interesting? Um, so you can hear things that aren't there. You can smell things that aren't there. People might smell smoke or something that's not really there. You can feel things that aren't there, like a spider crawling up you that's not there. And you can also taste things that aren't there. So you can have a hallucination. I, I would hope that my hallucination would be tasting, you know, a strawberry daiquiri more than tasting something that wouldn't be. <laughs> as nice to taste. But a hallucination can be any of your five senses you hear mostly about visual hallucinations. So it's something that's not there, that, but your body for some reason thinks it is. A delusion is a false thought, okay? So I had a client that always came to see me, this deaf man, who said that every time he drove home from work, now he worked near Andrews Air Force Base near here, which is where there's a lot of airplanes and helicopters and things coming 
um, out of. And he said to me that he always felt like uh, he was being followed by helicopters. <laughs> okay, every day when he drove home from work, he was being followed by helicopters. Well, that's a delusion. He never saw the helicopters. So if he saw helicopters that weren't there, that would be a hallucination. But if he thinks the helicopters are there, you, if he never sees them, that's a delusion. So it's a false thought. <clears throat> So the visual hallucinations can lead to the delusion, the false thought, that you're bigger or smaller than you really are. Does that make sense? So with this syndrome, you can have both hallucinations and delusions. Um, you can also have depersonalization. Depersonal, depersonalization is when um, you don't feel you are who you used to be, um, like the quote. Uh, you feel different. You feel that, um, you know, I'm not a teapot collector, I'm not a clinical social worker, you feel that you're somebody different. Or you feel that things are personified, um, you might see a cat and feel the cat can talk. That could be a Cheshire cat. Um, you, so depersonalization, you feel different than you really are, or things around you are different than they really are. There's also alterations in the perception of time. Uh, things are much slower or much faster than normal. Okay, so it all sounds very Alice in Wonderland-y. But, as you all already said, did Lewis Carroll have it? And the answer is probably not. I mean, we'll never know for sure, but probably not. Um, Lewis Carroll did have migraines. Uh, he describes in his diaries about bilious, bilious headaches. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, bilious headaches that were sometimes preceded by eye disturbances. Okay, And I, I thank my good friend Edward Wakeling, who's Skyping in. <laughs> who helped me go through his diaries and look some of this up. Um, he also talks of eye fortifications in the diary beginning in 1888. Okay, in 1888, he's talking about migraines in 1885, um, and he talks about eye disturbances in 1888. Well, the books were written way before that. Well, not way before, but they were written before these were put in his diary. Um, eye fortifications are now called optical migraines. I don't know if Anyone's ever had them? I actually have. <laughs> I've had an optical migraine. So all of a sudden, your vision get little floater things and it's really blurry and it looks like things are sort of going like this in front of your eyes. The first time I had one, I called up Ken and I said, oh my God, what's going on? He said, just lay down and close your eyes. And if you close your eyes, you'll still see it. So that didn't help very much. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, oh my God. But after about 20 minutes, a half hour, it just goes away. It doesn't impact your vision. It's just one of those weird things that can happen. <coughs> And so evidently Lewis Carroll had those too, so I have something in common with Lewis Carroll. Um, but he didn't get them till 18, uh, 1888, and they don't cause hallucinations or anything. You just see sort of these funny things or, or um, you know, blind spots in your eye. Um, so we've decided that he probably did not have Alice in Wonderland syndrome. His ideas of growing large and growing tall and necks getting longer and things like that are probably his own very good imagination. Okay, so there's another one. <laughs> uh, Matt Hatter syndrome. Uh, there's a medical syndrome that talks about the uh, effects of mercury poisoning. So if anyone knows about the Mad Hatter, the Mad Hatter uh, well, hatters back in the day worked to turn fur into felt, and they used a mercury solution, a solution with mercury in it, to change fur into felt. So um, hatters were exposed to mercury, and they also worked in very close, not very well insulated uh, places, shops, and so uh, they suffered from mercury poison. So people with the effects of mercury poison, poisoning, that's called the Mad Hatter Syndrome. Uh, again, some of the things can be psychological symptoms, but most of this is medical. Uh, so you can have trembling, loss of coordination, slurred speech, memory loss, easy blushing. I thought that was interesting because you've seen some pictures of the Mad Hatter uh, with very rosy cheeks. Um, so easy blushing, someone who's quarrelsome, and uh, someone with depression and anxiety. So the depression and anxiety would be more of the psychological piece of that. So the mock turtle was working with the adder under... The mock turtle was working with the adder. <laughs> I think half the characters were probably working uh, with the Mad Hatter in the story. <laughs> That's my next talk where I diagnose every character okay. in the story. <laughs> okay. 
Then I found a few other. I like was just sort of Googling, and I was like, oh, there's a white rabbit syndrome. And um, I, I know people that have the white rabbit syndrome. Uh, so it's, it's a condition where people often or always have the feeling of being late. So there's two different kinds. You can have the feeling of being late, but you're not really late. And then there's those people that are always late, no matter what you do. Okay, so they have, they have the white rabbit syndrome. Um, the other one that I found uh, was the red queen <laughs> effect. Um, I thought that was interesting. So it's not the queen of hearts. I thought, oh, there must be a queen of hearts syndrome. And I was Googling that, looking it up. But it was the red queen effect from Looking Glass. And they named it for the red queen. Uh, because it says, now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Um, and this talks about, it's a biological um, evolutionary, evolutionary hypothesis that um, organisms have to work really hard to develop and to keep changing in order to survive. So it takes all the running they can do to stay in the same place. And that's called the Red Queen Effect. And that's used more in biology labs. You'll hear about that. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then in the 11th hour, as I'm like working on my talk more and more, I found the Snark Syndrome. <laughs> Yay. Um, so this was developed by a woman named Eileen Byrne at the University of Queensland in New Zealand. It talks about the um, discrimination and, and stereotyping that women are not good in the sciences. And she says that one of the reasons that women are not good in the sciences is because they aren't allowed to be and they're told that they should not be. And she uses uh, the Hunting of the Snark poem uh, to kind of show that. So what I say three times is true. Uh, what I tell you three times is true at the end in this poem. If I keep telling you that women don't go into science, women don't go into engineering, women don't go into technology, women don't do math, then after a while women think, oh, I shouldn't go into science, I shouldn't go into math, I shouldn't go into these things, because that's how you're raised, that's what you learn, and, and that's, uh, you know, what people start to think. So she coined it the snark syndrome, because what I tell you three times is true. When was that? Uh, that was very recently. That was in about, uh, I think it was around 2010. But I, so um, that's my talk. Those are the different syndromes connected. I think it shows that um, Lewis Carroll, his, whoops, can I get back to the, no, not letting me go. Anyway. There we go. So. Um, it, it shows the, uh, how well he wrote his characters. I mean, that, that things are named after the dodo bird, that things are named after the looking glass, how well his writings have impacted people, that um, you, know, you have all these things that are named after his characters, his writing, I think is a real testament to how you know, his impact on the world. And so I had a fun time uh, writing this talk and combining my two worlds. So thank you very, very much. Anybody have any questions or anything? Um, yes. It was very pleasant. When I was a kid, frequently, I would be waking up or going to sleep, and the door to my room would look really like farther away mm -hmm. than it was, and kind of slanted, and more like trapezoidal. And I get really ooh, spooky. And did that happen more when you were a child? Has it happened since you've been an I adult? I think more as a child. It happens more as a child. Yeah, but yeah. it was very pleasant. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, were, were there other questions? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, uh, you said that uh, Carol didn't uh, report anything about migraines until 1888. Right. Which doesn't mean he didn't necessarily have them before then. No, it doesn't mean he didn't have them, but you would think if he had them mm -hmm. and if things were going bigger and larger and different weird things were happening that he might have mentioned it in his diaries before that. I mean, we obviously don't know what he didn't write, but we do know. He was pretty good at recording a lot of things, so I would think he would record some of that. So, yes. So, I, I, I find it interesting that all the Lewis Carroll stuff can be very illustrative in your field, but I think that it's it's really um, so universal. Any field can have a talk like this. Yes. Right? I mean, yeah. think how many textbooks in various subjects start the chapters with Lewis Carroll books. Right. So, in, you know, I, I, it, it's interesting to see this, but I, I bet anybody could take their field, start Googling and you find all kinds of Well, the one things. thing, the Red Queen effect was biology. Mm -hmm. and, and it's exactly. interesting because um, our son is a, a 
PhD in math, and he's teaching at Boston University right now. He walks into the library there, and there's Lewis Carroll pictures all over the walls, which makes sense, right? But he's like, he calls me up and he goes, Mom, I can't get away from this either. You know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's just, it's everywhere. Yes, it's everywhere. Absolutely. Any other questions? I want to thank everybody. Thank you for finally letting me talk. <laughs> And in the future, my next talk is going to be the psychology of collecting. And I was going to get into that today, but we'll save that. Ooh. But I thought that uh, we would save that uh, for another time. So thank you very much. <laughs>